In the interview in this series, Flo and Michael went to the Oxford Internet Institute to interview their director, Helen Margits. We consciously elected to interview another woman because we'd noticed that most of our interviewees had been men so far. Now, why might this be? Well, that's a whole new topic for quantitative researchers. We also wanted to explore the experimental method because most of the data analysis that we explore in other parts of the series is secondary, i.e. it comes from surveys collected by external research institutes. So how and why did Helen choose to use the experimental method to explore what it is that encourages people to sign an online petition? I'm Helen Margett. I'm, a I'm the Professor of Society and the Internet here at the University of Oxford. And I'm the Director of the Oxford Internet Institute, which is a multidisciplinary department in the Social Sciences Division at Oxford. Uh, so to, to begin with, could you just give us a, a very short summary of, of your study and the, the, the objective study was set, set in seven. At the Oxford Internet Institute, we're interested in life on the internet. That could be political life, social life, economic life. Um, in this particular study, um, we were interested in political participation that is somehow mediated by the internet or social media. Um, now, everywhere on social media in particular, and the internet in general, there is social information. There's information about what other people are doing. It's much easier these days to know um, how many other people have done something. So if you sign a petition in the street, for example, um, you probably don't know how many other people have signed it other than the names on the page that you yourself are signing. Um, but on the internet, you generally do know how many other people are doing something and you know it in real time. So we're interested in the effect of that sort of social information on people's propensity um, to participate politically. So that was the idea of this study. Um, so we took an example of political participation that's very common in internet mediated settings, that is um, signing a petition in support of something. Um, we took a number of issues, we um, carried out an experiment um, where we varied the social information people got in, that, uh, um, in, in, in their group about how many other people had signed the petition supported the issue. Um, and, and we looked at the results. Okay. Um, can you explain a bit more about the experiment method in general? So what are the key features or what steps do you have to go about to set up an experiment? Well, an experiment needs three basic things. There's three basic characteristics of a piece of research to call itself um, an experiment. Um, one is that you have different groups. Um, and you randomly allocate people between two or more groups. One of those groups will be a control group, which doesn't receive the intervention, and the other group or groups are ones where they do receive some kind of intervention. Um, you measure the outcomes of the different groups, uh, uh, across the different groups, and if you've got a statistically um, significant difference, then you've got a result. So that gives you three basic characteristics. One, you have an intervention which you apply to um, one group and not another randomly, and those groups are allocated randomly, and then you measure the outcomes. Um, if you can't measure the outcome, if you don't have an intervention, and if you don't randomly allocate people between groups, then it probably isn't an experiment. Um, the important thing about experiments, the reason why they are good things to do, why people like me become very, very enthusiastic about the experimental method, is that when you have those three characteristics, um, you have the possibility that you'll be going to be able to identify a causal effect of your intervention. You'll be going to 
be able to say that something, in this case um, the provision of social information about what other people are doing, is actually having an effect on people's um, willingness to participate politically. And of course causal inference is something that's lacking in so many of the other things we do in social science. Um, so if we have a survey, if we run a regression, um, if we do some elite interviewing, um, if we if we analyze um, a, a, a large scale data set, um, all those are good things to do and interesting things to do. But this possibility of getting causal inference is what makes um, experiments successful. So apart from causal inference, uh, are there other, uh, any other main advantages of, of using an experiment? What's that? Well, there are other advantages, but um, I, I mean, I think that's the key thing. That's what gets people really the kind of holy grail of causal inferences, what people it gets people inspired about experiments. Um, and I guess the other advantages are mostly things which are specific to different types of experiments. Um, so different sorts of experiments are good for different things. I mean, the basic distinction, for example, between laboratory and field experiments. Um, laboratory experiments where you have very tight control over what's going on. Um, you know that the people in your experiment aren't kind of vulnerable to any other influences. Um, is has what we say, what we call a high level of internal validity. Um, you've got a lot of control over what's going on um, and you can be confident that if you identify a cause and effect, that your intervention is causing that effect. So laboratory experiments are very good for internal validity. Field experiments, where you have some kind of natural, um, natural setting and you apply an intervention to a randomly allocated group of people in the real world, if you like, um, have what we call high external validity. That is, we can have some confidence that this is the real world and that um, the effect you're looking for or identify is actually something happening in the real world. In the laboratory, you can't be, you, you, you can't be sure of that. If you, if this particular article we're discussing with, um, was, um, uh, for example, the pilot uh, for that um, experiment was carried out in the laboratory. Um, and you're inevitably simulating an artificial situation. You can't be absolutely sure that it would work like that in the real world. In that sense, you have no external validity, and that's the disadvantage of a laboratory experiment. Having said that, I mean, there's another reason why we did that. Um, again, something I haven't mentioned, but there's always a question when you're carrying out an experiment. And that is, we didn't want to use deception in this experiment. We didn't want to tell them that this many other people had signed something when that wasn't true. Um, and we went to a lot of trouble to find petitions out there in the real world um, that uh, really had been signed, and really had been signed by that number of people. Um, deception is a challenging issue um, to the experimental method. It's many times when you might be designing the experiment and you, the easiest thing would be to tell people that something something was true when it wasn't. For example, it would have been really nice if we could have told people, you know, three million people have signed this petition, um, five million people have signed this petition, you know, making the social information really high um, so that we could be more confident that we would, would be seeing a clear um, effect. Um, we didn't do that because it's not true. <laughs> so it was, and um, but deception is a tricky issue. Um, it varies across disciplines, actually. I mean, economists, for example, don't practice deception. Um, one of the main reasons for that is that they don't want to contaminate the subject pool. They don't want to contaminate the subject so that next time they do an experiment or people, if people who've spoken to your subjects do an experiment, um, they think, don't believe what you're saying because last time it wasn't true. Um, so deception is a very difficult issue. It's kind of ethically difficult. It's also difficult from a more pragmatic, from a more pragmatic perspective that 
um, you run the danger of contaminating um, your subject pool um, or people that you might want to do experiments with again. Um, so it's a tricky issue, um, but also, um, I guess in a way, the desire to not deceive people also can push you in a way to make things more like the real world. Um, of course, in a field experiment, there's all kinds of things that happen by very virtue of it being the real world, um, like people dropping out of your treatment group um, or being exposed to other influences, and um, that's a drawback of field experiments. Um, I could go on. Some experiments take place on the internet. Increasingly these days, we're looking ways to um, carry out experiments on the internet itself, especially researchers like us who are interested in um, what's going on on the internet. Um, and that's got a whole other kind of raft of advantages and disadvantages. So when you go beyond causal inference, um, what you're looking for is the differences between different sorts of experiments. They're good for different things. So what sort of scenarios are appropriate to use an experiment in, and where would you tend to use a different method? Well, some, uh, sometimes you can't, actually, um, you can't actually design an intervention. Sometimes it's very difficult to design an intervention. Um, when it comes to something like observing the effect of social information about what other people are doing, um, usually it is possible to design an intervention, it seems to, that particular context seems to lend itself quite well to um, an experimental setting. And you will see in the article quoted quite a few of other researchers who have carried out experiments on the effect of social information. Um, some of the most famous were carried out at the uh, um, at Yale universities by um, the researchers Donald Green and Gerber and their, te and, and their team. Um, looking at the effect of social information on people's propensity to vote. Um, so there's a context where the experimental method seems to work well because it's easy to think of an intervention to, design, um, to, to build into your design. In other situations, it just may not be possible to somehow simulate um, the, uh, the, the context that you want to examine. Um, and then obviously you're going to have to use some sort of other sort of methodology. Um, you, you've, you've mentioned some of the, the drawbacks of the various experimental methods. Um, are there any ways of, of mitigating them, like maybe um, uh, uh, piloting or, or using various um, methods in the same in the same way? Well, I guess one of the ways uh, the ways of mitigating um, them are improving your design. Now, that might be. Um, selecting a field experiment or a lab experiment um, because of the um, advantages and disadvantages that I've just been talking about. Um, other ways to improve your design are, yes, running a pilot could be one way um, to improve your design. I mean, in general, like many areas of research, the best thing you can possibly do is triangulation. So ideally, you would um, do a lab experiment and a field experiment, um, or you would do an experiment um, which, like many things, basically tells you what you did wrong, and then um, tackle the areas that you did wrong. Um, so make kind of micro changes to the experimental design until you get it just right. And very long-running experimental programs really show the kind of pegs of that, if you think of the late Eleanor Ostrom and her work on um, uh, experimental work on on the design of uh, uh, the design of uh, uh, common good solutions. Um, that's a very good example of, of, of kind of constantly refining the method and getting it better and better. But of course, it, one of the drawbacks of experiments that I haven't mentioned is they can be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, for lab experiments, you have to pay. Um, subjects for field experiments, you have to uh, reach a lot of people um, and somehow measure outcomes which can be um, labour intensive and expensive. So, you know, it's not always possible to do that, um, but that's what you should be aiming at.
Um, more, more precisely on your article, uh, you, you used a pilot before you, you, you did the, the actual experiment. Um, are there any, any considerations uh, you need to take into account for a pilot, or is it did the exact same experiment you want you would want to uh, to apply uh, to administer to the to, to the real groups? Um, it's always a good idea to do a pilot um, because a pilot uh, if you, it's very difficult designing experiments, and you can have bright ideas that actually when you get into the lab or get into the field they don't work. Much more difficult to do a pilot in the field experiment. Um, uh, but in a laboratory, really, um, there's no excuse for not doing the pilot because apart from anything, nearly the um, vast majority of experiments these days will be delivered via um, some kind of interface. Um, and you really need to know if the interface works and how long it takes and other people understand. Um, we would always run a pre-pilot as well, where you get some, um, maybe some students or some colleagues to kind of test out the interface. Um, in this case, the pilot was quite important because we wanted to get an idea of the levels of different sorts of social information. You know, what constituted high, what constituted medium, and what constituted low. And we did all our analysis with those variables rather than the actual numbers. Um, so. That was important, and it gave us a sense that kind of if you go over a million, um, then that seemed to have a different sort, make a different sort of difference um, from the more middling numbers, which could still be in hundreds of thousands um, at that time. But it, it, it just seemed to be a kind of a step change, um, and that was important for how we did the analysis and how we did the experiment. We've talked a bit about deception. And obviously, ethical considerations in terms of experiments is a really, really broad thing. It's something that obviously people put a lot of, of thought into. But are there any other major ethical considerations that you have to think about when doing this particular experiment? Well, in any university now, and quite rightly so, you must get approval from an ethics committee before you do any research, and particularly when you carry out an experiment on human subjects. Um, and that's important and increasingly important um, in the days of uh, internet-based experiments, um, where what you're doing might, for example, be unethical in the sense that you're deceiving people, but um, might also be illegal <laughs> in terms of what you're doing with the social media platform or, 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 or something like that. Um, there's lots of ethical issues and experiments that have been confronted over the years um, and I think a couple of them might be cited in the study or any, um, any textbook on experiments will tell you about them. Um, and for example, Milgram's famous experiment where to test the extent to which people were willing to um, follow orders um, in the 1970s where um, people were invited to view a subject who was being, they were told, subject to electric shocks, um, and they kind of listened to the ensuing screams of agony, and there was a certain point at which, um, a, a certain point at which they either stopped or, or, or carried on, they were told to carry on, and it was to see how far they would go um, in following the instructions um, of the people in white coats, as it were. Um, now, that experiment would not receive ethical clearance today for very understandable reasons, um, nor would the one that was uh, subsequently carried out to kind of replicate the results where um, the same experiment was carried out on Labrador puppies um, uh, and real electric shocks were administered. I don't think that one would get ethical clearance either. Um, there's a lot of kind of experiments from the noble past of experimental history that would not get ethical clearance. And um, at the same time, you know, there are very important experiments carried out in the health field, for example, um, where, yes, you delve into kind of issues where subjects might find it disturbing because we're doing, for, for, for some medical reason or for some social good reason or something, 
um, like that. So it's not to say that such experiments never, uh, uh, are never carried out. Um, something like this, I would say, well, if you're not deceiving people, then it's reasonably um, uncontroversial. Um, we didn't really do these people any harm. In the pilot, for example, they came into the lab. Um, the uh, main experiment was carried out um, remotely in people's homes. Um, they were paid some money for typing away um, for uh, uh, a certain amount of time. Difficult to see how it was confronting major ethical barriers or that they would have been really traumatized. Mm -hmm. Having said that, again, like many things with experiments, there are disciplinary differences. If you're doing an experiment in economics, then um, you must apply variable, uh, variable incentives to your subjects. So they must, um, they must get paid for a start, um, but they must also get, get paid variably according to what they're doing, so that the incentive is built into the experimental design. Um, in health services research, at least in this country, that would not be um, that would not be permissible. If it's, in fact, if it's, if it's funded by the health service, then it's it's not allowed to use incentivization in that way. Um, possibly for I mean, in part, no doubt, for for ethical reasons. So. Yeah, there's differences between disciplines. Um, we follow the economist line in this experiment. We gave people um, money according to what they did in the experiment um, because we asked them to make a small donation to the issues to see how far they would go um, in their willingness to support something. So um, that's what we did. Um, in other disciplines, that would be yeah. And then I suppose there's a whole new realm of different ethical issues once the internet is brought in. That you probably found or haven't been thought about before. Is there anything specifically to do with the internet that you had to deal with in the past, maybe not in this article? But in... Yeah, as I said, I mean, there's all sorts of things you have to comply with um, in the internet world according to the, um, uh, according to different platforms like Facebook, um, uh, Twitter, etc. Um, privacy requirements, for example, um, you can't access people's um, uh, people's names, people's addresses. I mean, and then these are things that we do almost without thinking in the lab anyway. Um, you know, we always promise complete anonymity. We don't record people's um, we, we have people on our subject database, but during the, after the experiment, we don't in any way link up their names with what they did in the experiment, and that's that's very important. Um, those issues are slightly different um, on social media platforms because um, they might be um, kind of unconscious participants if it's more like a field experiment, for example, but the, the same things apply. So um, more, more specifically on the, on the sample, uh, the, your treatment group and your control group, um, how, how, is, how is your subject database constituted? Are, are the same, is it subject to the same um, Restrictions as, as, a, as a survey sample? No, um, that is another advantage of experiments. Um, they don't claim to be representative. What matters is that the subjects are randomly allocated between treatment and control groups. Um, you're not claiming that it's representative, um, therefore, you don't have to try and make it so. And indeed, it's not. Um, we did this with the uh, subject database of uh, laboratory um, we ran here at Oxford called the Oxlab um, jointly between um, Oxford Internet Institute and South Business School um, so we maintain that database every so often we put an advertisement in the local um, online um, news uh, I should have been in Oxford called the Daily Info a bit like Gum Tree and we advertise for subjects we maintain that subject database, we have people, and when we're going to run the experiment, we invite people from that database for the experiment. That's not representative, um, and that doesn't matter, um, as long as we run the allocate them between control and treatment groups. Did you take into account other social characteristics that might affect mobilisation? Um, and also, did you 
think about whether the participant had already heard about the big conditions that you used before undergoing your experiment, and what, what effect would that have had? Um, well, I'm a political scientist looking at political behaviour on the internet, so I think quite a lot about the other things that could yeah. cause people um, to participate politically or not. Um, and yes, indeed, we have investigated those things as well. Um, so, for example, I would argue that social information is one of the key kind of drivers of political behaviour um, in internet-mediated settings. Another one is visibility, um, the fact that other people can see what you're doing. And that's also influencing the way people behave politically. Um, and we saw that in the Ice Bucket Challenge and in many other, um, in, 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 in many other kind of internet phenomena that have, have kind of attracted widespread attention. Um, so visibility is another key thing um, that's worth testing, and we've done that in other experiments. Um, and we have even tested the effect of visibility and social information um, at the same time um, uh, in an article coming out in June of Critical Studies. Um, leadership without leaders. Um, so you can talk about that um, if you're interested. In general though, when you were did th this was the first of a kind of uh, a tranche of work and um, in general it's best to sort of start off with testing one thing. Because as soon as you test two things then you've got all sorts of complicated things and interaction terms going on. And remember that particularly um, in a laboratory experiment, but also in a kind of quasi uh, field experiment like this, where you're still kind of people, you, you, you're still paying your subjects, incentivizing your subjects, and, 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 and therefore limited in how many you can have. Um, you, as soon as you start analyzing it um, and controlling for different variables and thinking about interaction terms, your boxes get smaller and smaller. Um, and you quickly find yourself with a small numbers problem, even though you thought you had a really um, satisfactorily big experiment to start with. Um, so it's best, certainly at the beginning, not to um, try and test the new things. Um, but yes, um, if you were going to ask me what the three key influences of political participation in internet media settings, I would say that it was social information, um, that's you looking at other people, there's visibility, um, people looking at you, um, and then there's network effects, the effects of um, knowing about people um, that you're somehow close to you, or that you're friends with, or you know, or, uh, in your social networks, um, and being influenced in some way by that. Could you, could you please explain in, in more detail figure two of uh, the article? Certainly. So, figure two is a certain way of presenting it graph, which I think is quite useful for experimental results. Um, I mean, it's just a descriptive graph, um, but it shows uh, uh, it shows the effect of different types of social information. Um, and this is something to remember if you're ever carrying out an, uh, an experiment looking at social information. Um, first of all, it may well look as if it didn't have any effect at all, and that's because the effect of different levels of social information will cancel each other out. Um, so this is a way of distinguishing between the different levels of social information. Um, that is, um, the, the difference between the control group who didn't receive social information, um, and then those people who received low levels of social information, or medium levels, or high levels of social information. So what it shows is, for example, the yellow bars show very little difference from the control group um, because they're very close to zero on the y-axis. So very different, a very little difference from the control group, suggesting that when people know that 10 or 80 other people have signed a petition, knowing that makes very little difference to whether they themselves are going to, find, going to sign. That was quite interesting to us actually because in the pilot um, we found that low levels of social information actually had a negative effect. Um, that it made people less likely to sign.
um, than if they received no information at all. That was one of the reasons why we wanted to have low numbers in the experiment um, and uh, why we wanted to, to test for that. But in this substantive experiment, we didn't get that effect, so we just got to no effect. Um, it also suggests that median levels of information, and median here is a very big category, um, kind of above 100 but below a million, um, uh, had a positive effect. I mean, as you see later on in the article, that positive effect wasn't significant. Um, but it shows that for some of the issues, the median level of information was having a positive effect, and it certainly wasn't um, um, a negative effect. But then you can see that in some cases, for some issues, it actually um, is, 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 is having a slightly um, negative effect. Um, for example, um, uh, moving for human rights in Tibet. Um, you can see that the medium levels of information have a negative effect. Um, then for the red bars, which is the high information, um, over a million um, signatures, you can see a very clear um, positive difference when compared with the control group, um, which is only zero, um, uh, zero on the y-axis. Um, and that kind of, it gives you a descriptive picture of what's going on that you can then delve into um, with the regression. Um, so that's the thing you can do with that. Why, to start with interest, why did you decide to have the medium have to be so big? Was that as a result of your pilot work, or was that it was a result of the pilot work, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's not perfect. I mean, I would have liked to have run another 20 um, experiments like this in a way, because um, what's high, what's medium, what's low, you will see from the various kind of theoretical arguments at the beginning um, that that could vary depending on the perspective um, that you were coming from. Um, because high might mean high in absolute numbers, or it might mean high in terms of the percentage of the people who possibly could sign it. Um, and it's not very clear what people thought about that here. And if you're going to press me on the weakness of, an experiment, of the experiment, I would say um, that was it. Um, we've done it in different ways in other experiments, but in this one, we went for sort of global political issues, and in that sense, we were expecting people to be influenced by the absolute numbers rather than the latent group, because they didn't really have had an idea of who the latent group was. Um, I would have liked to get more of a sense of what people did think about that, and if I was going to do this exact experiment again, um, there would be a redesign that I would do, which is, and this is time dependent. I mean, remember this is a while ago now. Um, but at that time, the highest petition um, to the UK government, um, the, the most successful petition, um, was one on road pricing. Widely accepted that that caused the Labour administration at the time to reverse that policy on road pricing, and that got 1.8 million signatures. So you could have justifiably, without deception, have said to the people in this experiment, um, somewhere along the line at the beginning, or perhaps at the, on the screen, you know, they made the decision. Um, you might like to know that petitions that get around 2 million um, uh, do actually um, have, a, have a very are likely to influence um, policy makers, and that um, that would have given you a sense of the latent group. It would have given them a sense of the latent group, um, and you could have seen what kind of effect they had. You could have told everybody that, but you could have told um, some subset of the treatment group that. So that would have been interesting. But I think here people were really going with the absolute numbers. And we wanted to get a million in there because, in the end, a million is a significant number, it's pressworthy. As soon as the petition goes over a million, that makes it likely to catch the attention of the mainstream media.
The first thing that we've learnt from this video is that experiments are very, very different from survey-based research. In survey-based research, often we're striving for the most representative sample possible so that every member of the public, in theory, has an equal chance of being selected as part of the sample. That's very, very different in experimental treatment groups where instead of trying to get a representative sample of the public, instead what we do is randomly allocate the sample that we have got into different treatment groups. The idea being that you should then end up with people with a mix of education, a mix of ideas, a mix of ages, etc. in each of those treatment groups. Of course, with Helen's research, which was all about whether people are likely to sign a petition or not, one important intervening variable might be the amount of interest that they have in, in a particular social issue. So what they did to get around that, to account for the fact that some people may be more interested in certain issues than others, was they included a variable in their analysis which measured people's interest. A second thing that we learn from this exploration of the experimental method is that it aims to solve this issue of endogeneity. So remember, this is the idea of what comes first. Is it um, the independent variable or the dependent variable? The fact that two things are associated doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. The experimental treatment idea aims to solve this by actually mimicking what, uh, what it considers are the mechanisms between a dependent and an independent variable and also having a control group so that you can compare what happens when you don't have a particular treatment to what happens when you do subject people to an experimental treatment group. Thirdly, one of the problems with the experimental method is that whilst it has internal validity, i.e. it is accurately measuring what is going on in the laboratory, it lacks external validity, by which we mean you don't necessarily know if the findings that you get in a laboratory situation are going to work when people are running around in their everyday lives. Helen Margits gets around this issue by combining laboratory experiments with what she calls field experiments. In her example, she's able to actually follow people and their proclivity to sign an online petition She's lucky because many politics issues don't allow you to do a real field experiment. For example, we can't pop a dictator in the UK and see how people react. A fourth lesson is that the findings, as with any piece of research, they are only as strong as the variables that were put into them. So they're only as accurate as the independent variables. In this case, the idea was to measure whether the size of, a, of people who've signed petitions, whether that encourages people to sign a petition themselves. So is it the case that people are more likely to sign a petition that has also already had the support of a million or so people? It's a really interesting question and for Helen, a million is somehow a very magic number. But what this means in her analysis is that a petition that's been signed by a million or a million and one people is put in a different category from one that has 999,999 respondents even though there's a very small difference between those two categories. The middle category is huge here, it goes from 100 right the way up to 999,999 and then the next category is 1 million which suggests that she may have wanted to think instead of having a, an ordinal variable here for the size of petitions to perhaps think about having a scale variable instead that may more accurately measure those nuances. A final thing that struck me about this interview and the paper that they were discussing is that the analysis is actually very simple, probably the most straightforward regression model that we see throughout the whole series. After all that effort that has gone into recruiting participants, setting up the experimental treatment groups, and so on and so forth. I don't in any way want to suggest that a simple regression analysis
can't capture social and political realities. Perhaps it's quite a parsimonious and well-fitting model. But I do wonder whether there's some scope for people who run experimental methods to begin to work with some of the people who do more complex modelling, perhaps some more multivariate analysis or even multi-level analysis would be beneficial to improving research in this area. Thank you.